thanks, and thanks for the invitation. So, as it says, my uh, co-conspirator on this work is Constantine Telemann, and it's work in progress. <clears throat> so, the main question, a very general question, is if you have a gapped phase or a gapped system, does it admit a gapped boundary theory? And it always admits a gapless boundary theory because you can always tensor any given uh, boundary theory with something gapless. But we hear a lot of statements, and one of them occurred in Anton's talk, for example, that if you have such and such a theory in the bulk, then if you have a boundary theory, edge modes, whatever, that they're forced to have gapless ones. So this talk is an attempt to understand that statement in, in one case. And most of the talk will be motivating a mathematical theorem. At the end, I'll tell you what the theorem is and maybe indicate a few pictures that go into the proof. So uh, the first bit, while well, a phase here, the systems might be quantum field theories, they might be lattice systems, might be stat mech models, whatever. And uh, we can imagine a moduli space of such. You know this picture. These are the phase transitions, and the path components of that are the phases. And I guess one first implicit heuristic is that the answer to that question only depends on the phase, that if you take your gap theory and you move it, staying within that uh, equivalence class, the answer to this question doesn't change. So I want to move it to a field theory problem, because that's where our techniques lie. And there are two general principles, but they're general principles that aren't universally applicable. The first one is that the deformation class or phase of a system is determined by its low energy behavior, that the high energy short distance behavior doesn't affect the answer to that. And that the low energy physics, if the system is gapped, can be well approximated by a topological field theory. So we'll come back and revisit it. Um, I am aware of fractal <laughs> phases, and, but that's not the reason we're going to revisit it. But um, anyway. So if we think then that that principle is true, we can apply it both to the bulk theory and to the boundary theory. So that if we have a gap bulk theory and a gap boundary theory, then at low energy, this should be well approximated by a topological field theory in the bulk and a boundary theory for that topological field theory, which is also topological. So then the problem becomes one in topology. And furthermore, <coughs> if we think that this uh, approximation, we might think it has relativistic invariance, and that will tell us something about this topological field theory. It should have um, some kind of analog of that. Okay, so in mathematics, we have a framework since the 1980s, came out of the kind of Oxford School of Geometry, Graham Siegel in the conformal field theory case, Michael Atiyah in the topological case, an axiomatic way of understanding field theory, and I'll work certainly in this context, where field theory is written as a function with a domain and a codomain. The domain are manifolds, which you should think of as modeling weak rotated field theory. So n here is the space-time dimension. So n minus 1 is the dimension of space. To each space, we have a vector space. It's space of states. And this is a kind of wick rotated evolution. The purple arrows tell us which are incoming, which are outgoing. And we get a linear map. So a field theory essentially linearizes. And I didn't say what kind of manifolds these are. I told you they're complex vector spaces. That's the usual interference and superposition of quantum mechanics. And the relativistic invariance would say that these manifolds should be oriented, or if there's time reversal, not uh, unoriented. So what's a boundary theory? Well, a boundary theory is essentially a map from the trivial theory to your theory. So a generalization of that would be a domain wall, where you have a map between two theories. A boundary theory, we're going from empty, which means the trivial theory, into your theory. So that's what a boundary theory is. So for example, if I evaluate this on this configuration, this is a manifold x with boundary. I'm viewing the boundary as incoming. And I'm painting, so to speak, in green the boundary theory on this boundary. So if we just evaluated this without the boundary theory in this uh, bulk theory, we would get a linear map from the vector space of states of the boundary to the complex numbers. That would be a functional. You could think of that as kind of a generalized correlation function. 
But now with the boundary theory, what the boundary theory gives us is a particular vector in this vector space. When we just evaluate on the boundary, that has nothing to do with the bulk x. And so when we compose, we get a number, which is what you would have gotten in this theory if we had started with a closed manifold. So a boundary theory essentially is closing off the boundary, which is what boundary theories do. So here's a toy example just to illustrate why you might have a situation in which no gap boundary theory exists. This is very much a toy example. So this is zero plus one dimensions. These are manifolds. It might be simpler if I think of oriented manifolds, but think of a theory with a global uh, cyclic symmetry of order two. So that means these manifolds come with a double cover. If you like, that's a background gauge field. And a double cover has an automorphism that flips the two sheets. And so what it means is when we evaluate our topological quantum mechanics on this configuration, we get a vector space, which I'm taking to be one dimensional, and we get a representation of this automorphism, which I'm taking to be the sign representation. Just the non-trivial element, x is minus one. And so what's a boundary theory? Well, a boundary theory attaches to the same configuration a vector in here, but the vector has to be invariant under minus one. So the only invariant vector is zero. So this is just a toy example to show you that we might not have uh, non-zero boundary theories. All right, so now let's come back to the second of the two general principles. I said that if you have a gap system, it's approximated at low energies by a topological field theory. That's not always true. We might need an asterisk there. And What's the example? So it's uh, the kind of thing that occurred in Zohar's talk this morning. Uh, it was more complicated. But just imagine we had three-dimensional Yang-Mills, so this is a field theory, with a Chern-Simons term, and we want to make a long-distance approximation. Well, it's usually said the long-distance approximation is just the, the Chern-Simons theory as a topological field theory. But this physics theory is definitely um, uh, relativistic invariant from the beginning, and we expect that that relativistic invariance persists when we make this approximation. Well, when you do that, then we should get a theory of, as I said, oriented manifolds, but the, 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 the thing you get is not quite independent of the Riemannian metric. So this was already pointed out in Witten's first paper on the subject, that there's a dependence on the Riemannian metric. That's not usually how we view chern simons theory. But if we want to think of it as approximating a physical system, then we should really think of it that way. And the dependence on the metric is very mild. I think physicists would say this by saying that this uh, energy momentum tensor is a C number, not an operator. And it's a kind of invertible dependence on the metric. And in fact, Witten in his paper introduced a device to get rid of that, which is to tensor this theory you get, the actual physical approximation, by an invertible theory, which also depends on the Riemannian metric, but the tensor product of those uh, is purely topological. The price you pay is that you can't do that inside oriented Riemannian manifolds. You have to introduce some kind of framing. And so by the time you do that, you get a topological theory, but it's a theory of framed manifolds. That's what the FR is there. So is it really Bordesman invariant even when the central charge is not a half integer? Is, is what? The, this gravitational turn science term that he adds has a coefficient that makes it not have to do with the frame, uh, a frame Bordesman invariant unless the central charge is like a half integer. Well, the theory you tensor with is a theory which um, the partition function on a three manifold is an exponentiated eight invariant, but with a coefficient that's not defined unless you put a frame. I mean, the that eight invariant is not defined unless you put on a, 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 a framing. So it's a theory of framed Riemannian manifolds. But the dependence of this theory on the Riemannian metric and that invertible theory cancel out. And so in the end, you get a topological theory, no matter what. So, um, so if, if we imagine then that we had a physical system whose bulk theory was approximated by some kind of chern simons theory, in this example, which might depend on the metric, and it had a boundary theory, which was gapped, would also presumably depend on the metric. If we tensor the whole thing by this invertible theory, then we get, again, a topological problem. 
but now a topological problem about framed uh, topological field theories. So as I said, from a relativistic theory, you don't expect framing that breaks relativistic invariance, but this, in this particular example, you get that. F is a 3D theory or a 4D theory? F is a three-dimensional theory. So this means that it's a theory of two and three-dimensional manifolds. So the two-dimensional spaces and three-dimensional wick rotated space times that mediate between the spaces. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. So now, um, if, if I take you back to the introduction of Chern Simon's theory, which it was in the late 80s, uh, Witten introduced it starting from something very beautiful and beloved in differential geometry, this classical Chern Simon's invariant. And shortly after that, Rashtik and Atrayev um, produced a, a version of these invariants without the non-rigorous path integral, but starting from uh, very algebraic data from quantum groups, or more generally from modular tensor categories, as were discussed in the previous lectures introduced by uh, Warren Seiberg. And so it was a little bit of a mystery at the beginning how these two gave you the same uh, kinds of invariants, how there was one picture that incorporated them. And the answer is to uh, use an extended idea of field theory where we consider not just three-dimensional and two-dimensional manifolds, but also one-dimensional. And that's capturing further locality of making the vector spaces you attach to two manifolds local in space. And in that theory, what we attach to the circle then is a category. Well, so now instead of a map between one categories, we have a map between two categories. And this is the two category of linear categories. So to incorporate this locality, we have to use more complicated algebra to encode all the kind of cutting. And now the circle is a possible manifold. We can evaluate the theory. We get a category. And that category has extra structure because of the geometry of the circle and the disk and so on. So this twice punctured disk gives you a multiplication. And the braiding of those two circles tells you it's a, a braided multiplication, braided commutative. And so you get. Uh, you start to see the structure of this modular tensor category coming from the bordism. The, the geometry here induces the algebraic structure on the image through the theory F. And just a remark that in this framed case, three frame, there are actually two circles. One of them is bounding, one of them is not bounding. And the one that gives you the modular tensor category is the bounding one. OK, so now our question refines with this additional level of locality is, does this theory admit a non-zero boundary theory? Well, there's a powerful tool in the study of uh, topological field theories, which is the cobordism hypothesis. This was conjectured by um, Baez and Dolan in the mid-90s. And uh, it applies to theories that are fully local. So, so far, we have a theory we're imagining of one, two, and three-dimensional manifolds. That's the Rashtik and Tarayev picture, say. But here we have to go down to zero manifolds. So that's incorporating a very strong form of locality, one of the two pillars that Nima was talking about this morning. And so the domain now has to be a bordism category of manifolds of all dimensions below n. And for the target, well, we need an n category, and we don't know what to pick. So we'll just leave that uh, open. And then we have, again, a theory that preserves all the structures we have. And that's what a fully extended theory is. And what the cobordism hypothesis, which was proved in two dimensions by uh, Hopkins-Lurie and then by Lurie in general, says is basically that the theory is determined by its value on a point, that you can build every manifold basically out of a ball. Think of a point as being really a ball. And with the full locality, you can compute everything once you know what happens on a ball. And furthermore, that the values it gets, and this was Baez and Bolin's insight, that there's something very finite in the topological field theory about the values. So for example, the vector spaces of states are all finite dimensional. And there are stronger and stronger forms of that. And that's called dualizability in the, in the business. And if we start with something that's dualizable enough, then we can build up a theory. So, um, so that's the ordism hypothesis. And what it means is uh, 
that if we have a fully extended theory, then we can investigate this question about boundary theory by asking about it on a point. And so we can reduce this complicated question about field theories to a question about this data on a point at the expense that the data is a little bit more complicated algebraically. But that gives us a way to attack the problem. Now, so far, the Chern-Simons theory wasn't written as a fully extended theory. It was written as a 1, 2, 3 theory, not 0, 1, 2, 3. So we have to do that. Ten minutes. Ten minutes is good. So, um, so, so far, as I say, we have this resch tikhan trive picture in 1, 2, and 3. And this is a map of two categories. The two and two categories tells us how many layers, in a sense, we have. And when we had one category, we had vector spaces. Two category, now we have category of categories. But if we're going to go further, we're going to need a three category to put here. And we would hope then for a fully extended theory, version of the chern simons theory, which restricts to this, which really extends the resch tikhan turayev picture. Well, there are different ways one might do that, uh, so I'm not quite written yet, and so on. But for the theorem, we're just going to um, conceptualize conditions on this C and on this F, which will model the idea that we restrict to resch tikhan turayev So we're not going to commit ourselves to any particular extension uh, to a fully local theory, but we'll rather axiomatize in a way, or make assumptions on C and F, and then we'll uh, ask the question, does F admit a non-zero boundary theory? Yes? Excuse me. In the earlier slide, you studied this. You said the hopkin boole theory is more general, right? A any dimension. Is that yes. Right? But here, when you go to this slide, you restrict to only 3D below. Yeah, there. so the theorem I'm talking about is, I'm not going to answer the general question in all dimensions. It's, it's this kind of resch tikhan turayev theory only. So we're applying the cobordism hypothesis in three dimensions. Uh, what might be a difficulty for general? What might be a difficulty for general M? Is well, let me let me finish talking okay. about three. Okay. So let me remind you about Turayev Vero theories, which I think in condensed matter are also called Levin Wen theories. And um, for these, as I said, these are particular cases. We have to pick this target category. And for these theories, there is a good choice. And it's called the three category of tensor categories. So a tensor category is some kind of categorical version of a ring. And the theory of those was developed in many papers and also a beautiful book of uh, these people and others. And that's a chapter in algebra. That's a well-developed chapter in algebra, which we're certainly using. And to make it that chapter in algebra into the form appropriate to be the target category, the codomain of a field theory, there's work of uh, these people. So certainly in our theorem, we're relying on the foundations. Uh, lots of detailed work done by them. Now at this point, Ryan will give me an extra minute. There's, uh, in their book, there's a beautiful quote that captures the idea that cat when you get to three categories, that things get rather abstract. It used to be called even one category is the theory of abstract nonsense. And they put a quote from the Russian absurdist literature to describe what it was like. <laughs> so I'm sure some of you would sympathize with that. All right, in any case. Uh, as I said, that what you attach to a point has to be sufficiently finite, dualizable, in this case three dualizable, to determine a theory, and such finite tensor categories, one example of those are fusion categories. And uh, so a fusion category does determine such a theory, and this theory is called the theory of Turayo-Vero type. And in this theory, you can calculate, as I say, the point determines everything, so you can calculate every other manifold, for example, the circles. Remember the circles, well, the bounding circle gives us this modular tensor category, and the one you get from this kind of theory is uh, the modular tensor category that's called the Drinfeld center of this one. So for example, the uh, churn simons for a finite group, twisted or not, the dykraff witten theories are examples where there's a fusion category and its Drinfeld center is the uh, modular tensor category. These kinds of theories in the Chern-Simons world also occur 
uh, for certain torus chern simons theories, not for U1, but for higher dimensional tori when there are special levels. I think they're called K-matrices, maybe, in condensed matter. Okay, so these tori vera theories, they all have boundary theories, non-zero boundary theories. Essentially, a boundary theory is given by a, well, I said it's determined by a point. A point is given by this uh, categorical version of a ring, or an algebra, and um, what the boundary data gives you on a point then, the boundary theory, is a module over that algebra. And any algebra is a module over itself, just by left multiplication. And the same thing works in this categorified world. You might think of that as the kind of regular boundary theory. And so that's always a non-zero boundary theory. So these Toraya-Vera theories certainly admit them. And the theorem we prove says basically that that's the only case. So here's the theorem. As I say, the first part is, the first two parts are assumptions. This is the conclusion. The first bit of assumption is telling us uh, some assumptions about this target category. The second is telling us something about the theory and then the conclusion. And so what are they? Well, one thing we're saying about the target category is that it includes tensor categories, but it might be bigger. And if you want to make churn simons in general, when it's not one of these Toraya-Viros, if you want to make it into a fully extended theory, it will certainly be bigger. But we want it to have tensor categories as a, a, a piece so that it includes Toraya-Viro. The second part says that if I truncate to one, two, and three and look at where I get, then that's a piece of the category where we're only evaluating on one, two, and three manifolds. You might think of it as the loops of the category. And we get the two category of categories. So that's what we had in Resh, Tik, and Turayev, and that's what we want to maintain here. And these assumptions about F are basically that it's Resh, Tik, and Turayev. So for example, when we evaluate on the bounding circle, we want to get a modular tensor category. One way to say that is we know we get a braided tensor category by the pictures I showed, and we say that it's invertible inside that. And there's a theorem. Uh, I think uh, people are actually writing careful proof now, but there's a theorem that a modular tensor category is an example of an invertible object in this category. I thought FS0 should be a two category. Uh, no, f of a point is a three category. Uh, f, what? Well, an object of a three category. Yes. Okay. So yes. So f of s naught should be a fusion category. And again, in at least one way of making churn simons into a fully extended theory, that's certainly true. So as I say, these assumptions are really to capture that we're generalizing churn simons theory, but we've made them quite general. And so what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion, heuristically, is that we get a Torai of Vero theory. And it says that, so that when we evaluate on the circle, the bounding circle, <coughs> that we get uh, the Drinfeld center of a fusion category, which is basically <coughs> saying that it's Torai of Vero. So for example, if you look at U1 at level K, and you look at that churn simons theory, this would tell you something you already knew for other reasons, that there's no uh, gap boundary if you believe the heuristics that get you to the theorem. But the theorem says that that topological field theory does not have any non-zero boundary theories in the world of topology. So that's the theorem. And um, now I have how many minutes? Zero? Uh, yeah, I have questions. So that's a sketch of the proof <laughs> and uh, of some of the main steps in the proof. but. Again, we have this uh, theory, which is a map from boardism manifolds into some algebraic structure. And so each manifold gives us something in algebra. And playing with the manifolds gives us structure about the algebra. So for example, we have to produce a fusion category out of this assumption if we want to prove the theorem that says you know, this is you know, roughly the Drinfeld center of a fusion category. And we can do that by evaluating our theory on an interval by putting our boundary theory at the two ends. Again, that makes it as if it were a closed one manifold and then we get a category. And we can see that category has a multiplication by pictures like this. But I've drawn these framings because this is a frame theory, as I said. We tensored by this invertible thing to move us to topology at the expense of having framings. 
And so these framings you have to keep track of. It's a little bit more finicky than the usual oriented field theories. OK, I'll stop there. Thanks. Good questions. In the case that it's parallel set of charge zero, can you get rid of the frame? J just do everything with no frame? Um. I think that's right, but I don't want to. I mean, yeah, I think I think that theory factor is true. Not having a framed one. Yes. Oh, so one mechanism physicists use uh, in your language will be constructed some Lagrangian sub subset of some manifold on two dimension to get a gap under three D transignments. And uh, I wonder, in your construction, is there something beyond this? The language in this, uh... Well, I mean, if you have such a Lagrangian that shows you, I think, that this that your modular tensor category is a Drinfeld center, so that's consistent with the theorem. The theorem is in the opposite direction to say that if you have a non-zero boundary condition, that's the only thing that can happen. Or if you like, if, 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 if it's not the Drinfeld center of a fusion category, then you cannot have a non-zero boundary condition. And that's the case that forces uh, well, if you believe the heuristics, that's the thing that forces the gapless modes. So it says the complete obstruction is whether it's a Drinfeld center. I should say that the same people and others uh, introduce a wit group of braided tensor categories precisely to measure whether or not there's a whether or not it's a Drinfeld center. So another way to say it is that that class of your modular tensor category and that wit group is the complete obstruction to having. Uh, Gap boundary theory. I have an impression your work is beyond Kabusin Salina's uh, boundary conditions. Is that true? Uh, Kabusin Salina may have some boundary conditions. Well, again, our theorem is proving an obstruction to to having them. It's not trying to produce examples. I mean, I told you that the tribe Vero theories always have examples. Yeah. Uh, my understanding was that. Right, insurance assignments is a fully extended theory. It wasn't something that was known how to do. Uh, has that changed? Or is it still um, Yeah, if we write okay. all of our papers, it might change. But um, yeah, that's a little different story. But I, I think that's possible. And Enrique is also, I mean, there are other, yeah, there's other people doing things like that. Yeah. Did you just prove that that's impossible in some cases? No, no. What's impossible is to have a non zero boundary theory not to write churn simons as a fully extended theory. I think that you expect. I mean, especially if it comes from a physical theory with strong locality, you would certainly expect you could write it as a fully local theory. Uh, yeah. I might, I might repeat one of Jubin's questions from earlier, that in higher dimensions, do you still expect that if you have a non-zero topological boundary condition, that you, are the that, that, that you are the higher theory evaluated on a circle? I don't know what it means you are the higher. Uh, the equivalent of being the Drinfeld center. Oh, sorry. You, you need some model for the higher category that would be the codomain. OK, I see. There, there's not an immediate way to generalize. OK, thanks. Sure. Let's thank Dan again.